A reading from the book of Acts. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Paul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. With Paul's conversion story that we hear today, Luke, the author of the story, goes to great length to demonstrate that nobody finds Jesus, but that Jesus finds us. Paul, we learn, was one of Christianity's greatest critics. He even took delight in the Christians being punished and suffering for their faith. There was something in him that we might call evil. In a way that he felt was faithful to his own religion, Paul was hellbent on causing as much trouble for Christians as possible. He was a man that we might not think is redeemable. Somebody that you might never expect to one day be one of the greatest voices in Christian history to proclaim the gospel. But as we all know, this is exactly what happens. And why? Because Jesus chose him. Because of God's work in his life despite him. It is quite evident that Paul was unable to choose Jesus Christ as his Savior. He hated even the thought of Jesus. He hated the ideas that there was this new way called Christianity, and he wanted more than anything to wipe it off the face of the earth. Paul was one of the greatest enemies to early Christianity. But then something life-changing happens to him. Jesus chooses him. Jesus chooses him to be an instrument that God will use for the furthering of the kingdom of God. Something outside of Paul happens to him. External forces change who this person is completely. Paul could easily be the greatest example of a person who doesn't deserve to be a Christian. 
a persecutor of Christians himself. Yet we see here today that this doesn't stop God from choosing him. Paul's actions, his beliefs, his life choices, none of that stops him from being a Christian. God still chooses him. Yes, Luke goes to great length here with Paul to demonstrate that nobody finds Jesus. Nobody deserves Jesus. But instead, Jesus finds us and offers us grace. Jesus finds us and doesn't hold us against ourselves, but instead sees in us what only God can see, the true potential that God put in there in the beginning. Jesus chooses us not the other way around. And he chooses us for reasons beyond our ability to know. He chooses people like Paul and you and I with a grace that is hard to understand, seeing in us things that we could never dream would be a part of our lives. And as we come to understand today the good news with Paul's story, Jesus isn't looking to hold our past sins against us. Instead, Jesus is looking to transform us, to heal us too and let the scales fall from our blind eyes. Jesus picks us, taking us from our evil ways of life, taking from us our blindness, and he offers us a light in life that changes us completely, a new way to see the world that we have never seen before. This is God's work in our life. The Bible tells us, not our choices that do it. Being a Christian, a chosen one of the Christ, isn't about who you were. Like with Paul, Jesus doesn't choose us because of that. He chooses us because he knows what we will be. He alone knows who we can really be, and he is determined for us to see our true potential too. It's countercultural, I know. The Bible tells us that we aren't the sum of everything we've done and the choices we've made, at least not in Jesus' eyes. It's about the future life in him, not our past. In Christ, you are whatever he makes you to be. And that, my brothers and sisters, as we know, is a child of God. It's not about what you've been. That's forgiven. No, it's about what you can be because of Jesus' decision. Christ sees what we can't and chooses those to follow in his footsteps and preach the gospel for reasons that we will never fully understand. He sees what we really can be He sees the potential he put in us when we were born. He chooses us, and not because of who we were or even are, but because of what we will be in him, what we can be in him. Sure, the past matters, and the gifts you've always had, but what we learn through Paul's conversion story here is that God is going to use those parts of you in new and more amazing ways than you've ever dreamt possible. And it's always been this way. Jesus choosing the fishermen to be his disciples is just another example that we know well. So yes, who you were in your past matters, but definitely not in the way that you probably think it does. God turns those things around in this world, turning even our most sinful ways into things that give glory to God, the real purpose of life, the Bible tells us. Because of Jesus, we get to be who we were created to be, despite anything in our past. It will all be used, every part of us, for the glory of God. Even those bad parts you might be ashamed of, it can be used for the glory of God. This is our problem sometimes, maybe most of the time, I think. The tempter wants us to keep seeing ourselves as who we were instead of who we are becoming. There's that little voice of evil that tells us to persecute ourselves, telling us that either we are not worthy at all, or the other extreme, that we are more than worthy, that our salvation is up to us, up to us choosing God or not. Yet today we see again 
that the Bible tells us it just doesn't work that way. We can't choose God. God chooses us. As it says in the book of Concord, as the Lutheran reformers said it, and I quote, We cannot choose God. God chooses us. By ourselves, we can only choose to do what is opposed to God. Evil. This is the good news. It's not up to us. Salvation, 100% of it, is God's action in our lives. Loving us and choosing us to be a part of the kingdom despite who we've always been. It's simply just not about us as much as our ego wants it to be. This is God's work. Jesus has chosen you, not the other way around. Never forget that you aren't responsible for your own salvation. It's not up to you and your choices, your decisions. And this is the best news that we can ever hear. This is the heart of the gospel. It is Christ who has found you and loved you. It is Christ who died for you and saved you. Don't take that honor from him by claiming otherwise, please. All the glory belongs to God. On this side of Easter morning, we know that we are his now that we walk in the light, and that God's life is ours and our lives are God's. Take it from Paul. No matter what this world throws at you, no matter what persecutions you face, this new life in Christ is worth more than anything this world can ever give, beyond anything you could ever choose for yourself. Salvation is God's work in your life. And through that cross 2,000 years ago, that salvation was secured. May the glory be to God always. Amen.